Muy buenas, eh, buenos días, buenas tardes, eh, bienvenidos, bienvenidas a, esta, a este tercer día de Diálogos de Cocina. Eh, seguimos con un menú apasionante y bueno, es un placer daros la bienvenida otra vez desde, desde Bass Culinary Center. Hoy tenemos dos sesiones apasionantes, diferentes, eh, yo diría cada una dándonos una perspectiva diferente de la gastronomía y de lo que se puede hacer, de los retos, de, de la contribución. Y bueno, vamos a empezar eh, con, con dos grandes profesionales que, irán, que iremos invitando y que iremos dialogando, pero también en el día de hoy queremos cele celebrar el diálogo intergeneracional, eh, porque bueno, también diálogos va de esto, ¿no? de dialogar, eh, yo diría como consigna básica, pero también dialogar entre profesionales de diferentes disciplinas y en este caso entre diferentes generaciones, que es lo que queremos también celebrar hoy. Me acompaña aquí ya Marco Grechi, eh, que va a estar eh, dialogando con nuestro, el primero de nuestros invitados, con Dan Barber. Eh, bueno, el, Luego te presentarás un poquito, ¿no, ya Marco? Bueno, sí. ¿Eh? Gracias. Él, bueno, está, eh, él es, es taller, colaborador de Muaritz, pero luego si quieres así es, así eh, es. Te, te presentas un poco para que te conozcamos. Vale. Y bueno, pues él va a ser el primero de, vamos a decir, de los jóvenes. Bueno, todos somos aquí un poco jóvenes, ¿no? Pero él es el primero de los jóvenes <risa> que va a dialogar, en este caso con Dan Barber, y luego ya en la segunda sesión, Constanza, luego ya la conoceréis dialogará con la segunda de nuestras invitadas. Constanza es estudiante de, del Máster de Ciencias Gastronómicas en Vasculinary Center. Bueno, luego ya la conoceréis, lo dejo ahí. Eh, voy a pasar a hablar en inglés porque me parece que presentando a Dan Barber es lo que corresponde, pero sí eh, me gustaría deciros a los que estáis conectados que las intervenciones que vamos a tener ahora van a ser en inglés, pero... Ahí tenéis, entrando, si veis en, en la aplicación donde estáis conectados, podréis elegir el idioma que queréis escuchar en la intervención. Tanto el idioma original de la sesión, inglés, o podéis elegir castellano, español, y, y por tanto tendréis traducción simultánea. Eh, os, os diría a los que queréis escucharlo en, en español, que vayáis buscando donde se elige el idioma y así... Así podéis seguir la sesión tranquilamente y, y en el idioma que elijáis. Ya, Marco, primero, antes de pasar a Dan Barber, cuéntanos un poco. Bueno, de como, ti. como bien has dicho, eh, formo parte del equipo de Mugaritz de esta temporada. Eh, nada, gente joven que, que viene acá en busca de oportunidades para aprender y seguir creciendo en esta profesión. Y bueno, esta es una oportunidad, una de ellas, ¿no? de poder hablar con gente como, como Dan Barber y poder estar aquí en, en Diálogos de Cocina eh, compartiendo y aprendiendo, absorbiendo un poco de, de, lo que, de lo que pueden aportar las generaciones que, bueno, no que han pasado, pero que ya han tenido tiempo en esta, en esta disciplina, que nos puedan dar a nosotros luces para, para seguir. Perfecto, pues vamos a empezar. Uh, yeah, I would like to introduce and probably we can also have Dan Barber on the screen. I would like to introduce uh, Dan Barber and welcome him to this dialogue. Well, he's been uh, such an inspiration for Bass Culinary Center. I remember, Dan, uh, good afternoon. Good morning for you. Good afternoon. Pleasure to have you here. And I was remembering, you know, that this year we are celebrating our 10th anniversary. And I, I was remembering that incredible meeting, first time that international board, we met nine chefs and we, well, we let you talk and it was incredible to listen such different ideas, but at the same time, so inspiring. And, and it was amazing that magic moment, uh, 10 years ago. And well, I, I met you then and well, it has been, wow, a journey to, to talk to you, to listen to you, to observe the projects, the initiatives you have been launching, developing. And also because of you, 
and because so, so many conversations, we we started our our org our own garden, our own farm this academic year. So now we are a little bit more closer to the conversation we have had in the past. So thank you so much for thank you, all Jose. these years. Thank you, thank you. Great to see you again. Uh, great to continue the tradition and the conversation. Uh, and I'm excited to be here. Can I share my screen? Is that okay with uh, the group? Yeah, I, I come back to- Sure, and uh, I, will let, I will let Gianmarco, as I was, we were talking, he will be like, uh, leading the conversation with you because also we want to celebrate this uh, dialogue between generations. So I will let him a little bit more in charge of the conversation. I, am, I, I get listening. I stay listening to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, Good afternoon. Jeff. I want to start with uh, 2007 in California. Steve Jobs. He started Apple Computer and he launched, he introduced the iPhone. He said, the iPhone is going to solve for three problems. Nobody knew they were problems, but he said, we're gonna solve for three problems. Separate devices for music, for the phone, for internet connections. And he said, I have one solution. And he invented it, a very elegant solution. Now, in a world where flavor, the environment, and our own health are under siege, under attack, now in this last year, more than ever before, we actually don't need to invent the solution. We have it, it's seed, seeds. If we get it right, if we get seed right, you solve for flavor, you solve for the environment, and you solve for health. So we have to get it right. And right now, it's not right. These four companies, they control almost 70% of the future of food, 70%. These four companies are introducing seeds for the future but they are all chemical companies. They are not seed companies. They are chemical companies, chemical companies that own seed companies. And they own seed companies because they know that seed companies don't make money, but the chemical chemical companies do make the money. You make the money on the farmers buying the chemicals for the pesticides, for the fertilizers, for the fungicides, all the interventions in farming. They make their money on the chemicals, not on the seeds. That is the future of food. I said in a world like this last one, this last year where we've seen this epidemic, this COVID epidemic, show its ugliness in a very particular way. Here's one statistic, one. Of those who died in the United States of America from COVID, 92% had what the medical community calls underlying conditions. What are underlying conditions? The three underlying conditions for people who died of COVID were uh, something related to the heart, cardiovascular, diabetes, and overweight, obesity. 
92% of people who died had one or two or three of these conditions. And the issue is that all three of these conditions are diet related. They all, all are about food. In many ways, in many ways, a vaccine for COVID and for other epidemics in the future, we have the vaccine, healthy food. But in our country, especially in America, this is true across the world, but especially in America, we've seen now the effects of bad diet on our health. When 92% of the deaths are related to some kind of diet related disease. There's a great quote from a woman who I admire very much at Columbia University. She said, to prevent degenerative disease, degenerative disease is long-term disease, like diabetes, like hypertension. To prevent these diseases, there's not one thing you can do, there are only diets, diets. Another way of saying diets is cuisine, it's cuisine. So who creates cuisine? Chefs. Chefs and the community in which we are cooking, we create the patterns of eating over a long period of time. And in many ways, we create our own vaccine. Yes, it's the pursuit of deliciousness. Yes, it's the pursuit of happiness and creativity. But those things are also health, the same thing. And I wanna show you that today by first telling you a story. And the story started 10 years ago, 11 years ago now, when I met this man, Michael Mazurik. He came to my kitchen at the end of his meal, and we were standing right over here, and we were looking at a cook prepare butternut squash. And I said to him, you know, if you're such a good squash breeder, why don't you create a squash that actually tastes great? Butternut squash, you have to add honey and maple syrup and brown sugar and you have to make it, you, you have to add all of these things to make it delicious. Why, why? And I'll never forget what he said to me. He looked me in the eye and he said, I've never created a butternut squash that actually tastes good because nobody has ever asked me to breed for taste. No one has ever asked me to select anything for flavor. For me, this was a before and after moment in my career as a chef. It was only 11 years ago. But I never thought, how is it possible that breeders, the people who are creating our seeds are not thinking about flavor, that's crazy. Of course, they're thinking about what, what the industry, what, what corporations are asking them to think about yield, yield. How much, how much per hectare does that squash give us? What size is that squash? What color is that squash? Nothing to do with flavor. So I, so I said to him, well, why don't we work together on a squash? And we started tasting different possibilities of a new butternut squash, a new butternut squash. And we got uh, my cooks involved every day, every day. To work here at Blue Hill means to always educate your palate and also give feedback to these breeders about what you're tasting. And we spend a lot of time investing in flavor and different varieties. Eight years later, eight years later, we took the butternut squash on the left and Michael created a new squash, honey nut, a new butternut squash. It's fantastic, fantastic. And we started showing it to other chefs who put it on their menus and called it honey nut squash, a new squash. Not an heirloom, not an old squash, a new squash. And then the market saw what was happening because chefs were talking about this squash. Today, 
This squash is grown from New York to California. And it's in supermarkets from New York to California. And people at home are now cooking with this squash. And we are, cre we are working on the future of this squash. A little bit smaller, a little bit more flavor, a little bit better yield for the farmer. We're continuing to work. And just as Steve Jobs and Apple introduced the iPhone every couple of years, we're going to continue to improve this squash and introduce the updated version of this squash every few years. And we are going to continue to improve the flavor and continue to improve the nutrient density, the healthfulness of what you eat in this squash. Right now, this squash here that is out in the market is overall about 20 times more nutritious than this squash, just per bite. And that is just from Michael's work with breeding. To me, the nutrition, great. The flavor is amazing. And what I've learned from this work is that when you go after flavor, you go after nutrition, same thing. When you are creating seed and you're looking for the pathways to flavor, you are following the same pathway to nutrition, same thing, same conversation. We started a company together, me and Michael, called Row 7, to do more of this work. And not just at Blue Hill in my kitchen, but across the world. Chefs all over the world now are trialing our varieties. They are testing with us on new possibilities for the future. They are giving their feedback on flavor. And the farmers who are working with these chefs are giving the feedback on what is it like to grow. Does it do well in certain soils? How is it for disease resistance, for pest resistance? Because we're not interested in the chemical companies. We're not, we don't wanna support that. We wanna support organic agriculture because the best food is from organic agriculture and chefs know this. So we're working with farmers that are organic and want to see how do these seeds do in an organic environment? I wanna give you Another example of what is out there now, it's called the Badger Flame Beet. It was created by a brilliant breeder named Erwin Goldman at the University of Wisconsin. We've been working with uh, uh, Dr. Goldman for many years. And what he told me is he developed a beet that bred against that was, was getting away from the earthiness that you taste in a red beet, that very strong, earthy, some say dirty flavor of the red beet, so that he could get kids to like beets and get people who say, ah, beets, I don't like that flavor, to introduce some, a beet where you select it for other flavors, sweetness especially. And we trialed this and many chefs have used this now across the world. It was bred to be eaten raw, raw. And it is a fabulous beet that has redefined what a yellow beet can be. And we are introducing it all across the country and increasingly all across the world to get people to eat more beets. They're very nutritious for you. As we know, they're very delicious. And what is possible from a beet that has been selected for chefs like us is very different from what you get in a standard traditional beet. Okay, I wanna, I wanna, I have question and answer, question time, but, but I want to, before we do that, give you five uh, uh, examples of the work we're doing for the future. So for the cooks who are on this Zoom call, you may see some of these varieties in three years, five years, maybe even 10 years. It does take some time, 
but I want to give you an idea of what are we thinking about? What are we, what are we interested in? Okay, number one, a new squash, another squash. We don't have a name. Maybe we name it Jose Marie. It's a very, very special squash. Right now it's trial number 6018, 6018. It's the child of a squash that also Michael, my co-founder developed called Robin's Kogina. Very delicious, very sweet. But it's a large squash. And what Michael wanted to do, especially for us chefs and home cooks, is create a squash that was single serving, small, it can fit in your hand. So you can present it whole. Whereas this squash uh, serves five people, this is meant for one person. One other trick. This squash has what's called a ripeness indicator. What's a ripeness indicator? A ripeness indicator means that the squash stays green until it turns ripe. Then it goes to brown. Squashes on the market, they are brown from the moment they get to this size. They're very unripe. They stay on the ground another two months, ripe, 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 but they're always golden. They stay golden. So the farmer can pick it anytime they want. And they put it in storage and they gas it and then they ripen it in storage. So to prevent that, Michael created a ripeness indicator. So the farmer cannot pick the squash until it's ripe. And that means the distributor and the marketplace will not sell an unripe squash that happens to be the right color, no. This is a ripe squash with the right color. And this is what's possible with breeding. This protects us against processors and companies that want to sell the squash unripe, but the customer doesn't know. So now he's developed a way to keep it on the vine until it's ripe. And then, and only then, does it get ripe. And only then does it get picked. Full flavor, full nutrition. Example number two, oats. That's me out in the oat field with Dr. McMullen. This is a, a breeder from the Midwest of the United States. He's breeding a new oat for us that has 12% fat in the oat, 12%. The oats on the American market, they have about 4.5%, 5%. This is more than double. This new oat is more than double. And the reason that these companies have their fat content so low is because of this, this, um, this heart. It's called the heart healthy stamp. And the company, the, the American Heart Association says, you cannot have an oat that's healthy if it has more than 6% fat. They said this in the 1970s. So breeders like Mike, they had to start breeding oats with low fat. What's the problem with that? The problem is it doesn't taste good. And they have realized, scientists, that the high fat oats are where the nutrition is. Remember when I said flavor and nutrition, same thing. Here it is again. High fat oats are where all of the cancer fighting fats are, where all of the minerals and vitamins are, where it's where all the flavors are. So we're developing a fat that's double, developing an oat that's double the fat. We won't be able to sell it for oatmeal if we want a hard, healthy stamp on it, but who cares? We know it's much more heart healthy and it's 50 times more delicious. This is part of our future. We've worked on it very hard over the last couple of years and we introduce it very soon and hopefully we get it around the world. Example number three, this is a lettuce breeder. A lettuce breeder who worked for Monsanto. Uh, Monsanto's 
owned by one of these big, big guys. Maybe the most, uh, the biggest seed company and lettuce seed company in the world. And he left. He said, this is not right. There's so many health issues in the United States and around the world. Why is lettuce zero nutrition? Lettuce is water. So that doesn't need to be that way. We could breed lettuce with a lot of nutrition in it. And that's what you're looking at here on the left side, this field, filled with new varieties of lettuces that have a ton of nutrition. High anthocyanin, that's the cancer fighting possibility that's loaded into these lettuces. On your right, this is a spinach lettuce. Spinach. What's a spinach lettuce? He said, why do people eat spinach for salad? Why are we eating spinach raw? Spinach meant to be cooked. So he created a romaine, a lettuce that looks like spinach, but tastes like, like heaven. It's incredible and filled with nutrition, filled. What he said to me, nobody's interested in this. The distributors don't want it because they say there's no market. The market says no distributor will take it. I would love that no distributor will take this and there's nobody asking for it. Of course, of course. There was nobody, uh, 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 sorry, there was nobody, there was nobody asking for this either, right? Everyone was happy with that. Michael developed that and now it's everywhere in the marketplace. So part of the role of being a chef is to say, remember what Steve Jobs said, I'm gonna solve for three problems. Nobody knew it was a problem, nobody. So what, what our, our lettuce breeder, Bill Waycott is solving for is a problem that people don't realize is a problem. In the United States, lettuce is the number one eaten vegetable, number one. How much nutrition? Zero. Crazy. It's crazy. Why are we adding vinaigrettes and bacon and all this other junk to the salad to make it taste good? Why don't we have a salad that tastes incredible on its own? And we can. And this is not about going back 500 years to the way lettuces used to be. No, no, no. No, no, no. Because that is very expensive to grow. That's, that's 500 years ago. There are very important genetics in there. And what he is doing is taking genetics from the past, as all of these breeders are doing, and putting it together with modern genetics for a future, for the future, so that it can actually feed people, not just us, not just white tablecloth restaurants, expensive restaurants. No, this is meant for supermarkets. Okay. This is the kind of lettuce that everybody's used to the packaged green lettuce, no nutrition. And we need to get away from it. Okay, fourth example. I'm working with the most amazing potato breeder in the world. I, I love her so much. Her name is Susie Thompson. She's in the Midwest. So she breeds potatoes. You can see over here, these are pota potato uh, for fries, for French fries. She's the breeder for McDonald's. She's the breeder for all of them. All those potatoes are bred by her. And she said to me, you know, it's, it's, they come to me because they need very specific potatoes for frying. But there's such a world out there, as we all know, with these incredible potatoes. And I said, give me an example of the kind of thing that you, if you could wave a wand, you know, you were magic. You said, I wish this potato was in every home. What would it be? And she said, that's easy. This potato. I, I grow it every year. Nobody's interested in it. So I looked at it. I, you know, I went back to the kitchen. I, I tasted it. It's unbelievable. Uh, it's unbelievable. I had to go into a corner and shut my head. I said, like, I cannot believe how delicious this is. It's yellow and, and rich and buttery. And I called her up. I was like, Susie, what the, what is this? How is it that nobody is buying this potato? And she said, oh, every year that you grow it, it changes color. <laughs> I said, what? She said, yeah. It's got something in it called a jumping gene. Jump, 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 jump genes. She, she can't explain it, but it's part of the genetic traits of this potato that it changes color every year. 
So I said, yeah, okay, well, what's wrong with that? That's amazing. She said, yeah, but the supermarkets, they don't want something that changes color because it will confuse people. And when somebody likes the potato and they go back for it, they'll see it's different color. They'll think it's a different potato. I said, have you ever talked to a chef? She said, no, I never, I never in my life have talked to a chef. So we're trialing this potato. It changes color. This past uh, year, 2020, it was yellow, like bright yellow on the outside. No purple, no red, nothing yellow. It's crazy, crazy flavor and, and incredible yield. This is not an heirloom. This is not old. Any of these seeds at all. This, this gives, this could be grown by big, big farmers and supply a lot of people. And the nutrition on this versus regular potatoes. Oh my God. It's crazy. Okay. Last example. Last example you're going to see this summer. I hope uh, if enough people buy the seed and grow it. We just released it two weeks ago. It's called Midnight Roma. And the breeder, Dr. Jim Myers, again, nutrition. Tomatoes are very nutritious. Now look, in Spain, it's, it's half your diet is, is tomatoes. And since people eat a lot of tomatoes, what if we could use the popularity of tomatoes and increase, increase nutrition? So we started working with him on a, on a paste tomato, you know, one of these tomatoes. Tastes like nothing. You use it for sauces, you use it for tomato paste and started breeding in more of those anthocyanins I mentioned before, those high antioxidants. It's what gives a blueberry its status as the best fruit to eat, the most nutritious. And he developed this crazy tomato, crazy. It is so dark uh, purple and rich and, and flavorful. It's like you've never had a, a, a tomato like this. You've never had a paste tomato like this, that's for sure. It's very exciting. And if you get a lot of sun on it, like in Southern Spain, oh my God, it's just dark purple. It's almost black. It's crazy. Um, very exciting. And so I, I, last summer I made sauce with it and it comes out like almost black if you use the skins, which I love. Yeah, it's great. Great tomato, great flavor, great nutrition, not old seed, new seed. New seed that allows the farmer to make money to grow it, allows you and I to use it in our kitchens, but also the possibility that communities around the world could afford to buy it into their homes, which is what we need. Okay, we open this up for, for discussion. I, I only leave you with the thought that flavor and health are one and the same conversation. And the work that we are doing, that you are doing, is about not just pleasure for your customers, we now have a greater responsibility than ever before coming out of COVID. Restaurants and chefs need to talk about nutrition. We need to talk about new eating habits, not just in America, but around the world. And we need to be leaders on how we think about the future of food because nobody else will. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chef. Um... Well, um, I didn't get a chance to, to introduce you earlier, but I'd like to thank you for this wonderful talk. I think I speak not only on behalf of my colleagues at Mugaritz, but also on behalf of a good part of my generation. Uh, when I say that you are amongst the chefs of your, your generation, perhaps one of the most successful at, at using this space and this attention that, that our industry has gotten in the last few decades. Um, and put it to, to good use um, with a clear message. And Thank you. Who are you, man? Are you a, you're a cook at Mugaritz? Yeah, yeah, that's basically... How long have you been, how, how long you been working with Andoni? Uh, well, for a year now. Uh, it's been yeah. a year now. Uh, we did the season and then we did the creativity period and now we're approaching the beginning of next season um, with well, all the... You're with, you're with the best, the best. Thank you, thank you, yeah, I think I, think I am. And so, um, well, briefly, uh, I wanted to do a little recap of what you've been doing in the last year. I know it's kind of boring to talk about the, the pandemic all the time, and there are a lot of exciting things to talk about the future, and, and you have given us quite a few right now. Um, 
But the future concretely, you, it could not be brighter. The future. We, we, you're right. We talk so much about the pandemic and the 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 horrible devastation on restaurants in the United States around the world. Horrible, horrible. People's livelihoods and businesses evaporate. Right. But 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 it's also given us an opportunity to focus the importance of restaurants and gastronomy for the future like never before because we see the connection health and and cooking and gastronomy and your your diets it's it's the future and we have to lead the way and restaurants are a place to have this dialogue to have this exchange and it's in the context of pleasure and happiness it's not doctors it's not insurance people it's not politicians it's not your teachers it's not your parents or your grandparents no because nobody wants to listen to that everybody wants to listen to chefs because it's it's happiness and this is the key this is the key ingredient for the future you you speak a lot about um well flavor and you you seem to trust flavor as a as a major let's say weapon for change um yeah hey, i love that man flavor is the weapon of change dude i'm gonna use that nice work yeah yeah go ahead um can you um, translate that spanish how do you say that in spanish um i'd say el sabor como como arma de cambio flavor is a weapon of change well you 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 seem to be using that a lot lately and i wanted to ask you like I know from a, from a biological point of view, we have a lot of connections between flavorful and nutritious. Um, but at the same time, we've also seen um, the general population approaching other things as flavorful, competing with, I don't know, the use of, you know, sodium. Sugar, sugar, sugar. And all, you yeah, know. yeah, man, I, it's a great question. That's why so chefs need to define what flavor is. Why are we letting companies define what flavor is? It's fucking crazy. It's fucking crazy. It makes me so angry. And look at look at the effect. We knew it before COVID. Christ, I mean, you didn't need COVID, but look at COVID. It, it's your your. It's a death sentence, is what it is. It's a death sentence. Chefs curate flavor every single second. When I leave this phone call, I'm going into the kitchen. I'm tasting, tasting. All it's all we do. We should yeah. be determining what is flavorful, not McDonald's. Do you think restaurants alone and chefs alone are are going to be strong enough to to curate taste for the wider population, especially when we're working in fine dining establishments that only reach, yes, you know? Because everybody, yes, because everybody steals Andoni's ideas. Uh, everybody. <laughs> it goes down. It starts here and down, always. You know, this is about a movement that is not only bottom up, you know? We, we have to remember this, and it's hard hard to say without offending, but I'm going to say it anyway. What we need is to get back to traditional cuisines. You know, that's indigenous, because indigenous and heritage food is about the connection between land and health and, and flavor. I mean, I just got done with a residency with a West African chef from Nigeria well, I'm studying all about Nigerian food. I didn't know anything about Nigerian food. And oh my God, the fact the best cooks were the best doctors. That one of the same people, one of the same people. That's why that slide of the chemical companies is so important because they're about intervention. They're about growing a seed and then you intervene, you intervene, you intervene. That's our increasingly, that's our medical world. That's what's happening. You eat terribly and then you intervene with medicine. What indigenous teaches us is that that was never a luxury up until a hundred years ago in Nigeria anyway, up until 1930s, it was all about food as medicine, period. Food as pleasure, food as medicine, one subject. It's Western people who came in and said, no, food is here, medicine is here. And they run on separate tracks. That's crazy. So this, this need, we need the wisdom of the past, but we also need chefs here on the high end too, because unfortunately, in some respects, the high-end chefs do create um, uh, culture, some culture, some culture, some following. And in this moment that we have in high-end restaurants, people are following us, people are looking, people are paying attention. Okay, I'm not here to say that's better than following indigenous diets, I'm not. 
because the more I learn about indigenous diets, the more I am taken with what was discovered a lot, a long time ago. But I'm also here to say that with everyone on this phone who works in a high-end restaurant, to your question, you have a responsibility. And the responsibility is to show a way forward that yeah. is rooted in connection to our earth, which we're destroying, and connection to our health, which we're destroying. And it's all about good food. So I, so, so I agree with you. We individually, we don't have the power to shift these corporations away from their, their junky shit that's killing people. No, but together we do. Together we do because they don't create the culture. They just dumb it down. They dumb everything down. So let's yeah. start at a very high level. Let them steal our ideas, but steal our ideas in a way that improves the health of, of the world, which is, which is possible. One thing I take away from from your from your presentation is, uh, and you you mentioned Steve Jobs, which is you know in many ways a, a paradigm for innovation in in our society, and you're presenting a very different idea of creativity than what we usually see as the idea of creativity in fine dining and in these kitchens, right? Like we young chefs are are used to thinking about creativity as like combining ingredients in novel ways or creating dishes that, um, you know, create new textures or new sensations in ways that nobody has done before. But you're, you're looking at innovation um, from the product, from the seed, not even from, not even from the product anymore, but from the seed. Um, this is, I think, a, a slightly different conception of, of creativity, um, but that can go hand in hand with, with the other one. Um, in that sense, how is your project at row seven combine with what you're doing right now, for instance, with the, the chefs in residence program. And is there, is there a lot of inter, you know, intertwining of these projects? Yes, the, or? Intertw the intertwining is, it, and what I've learned, uh, and I keep, need to keep learning, is that seed selection was always about culture. It was not, you, seeds that developed over 10,000 years was a conversation between what could grow in certain landscapes and what was acceptable to the culture. We forget that, we forget that. We think, you know, back then they would, you know, any culture would accept anything that came out of the ground as long as they were eating. It's bullshit. The culture developed in part by embracing certain flavors. And they were all rooted in locality, in the environment for which they were grown. But it was both. It was not just agriculture. It was gastronomy from the, from the beginning, from the beginning. And that was food security. That was cultural identity. And that was progress. This is something that we forget. Today, we forget. And what you said is a big point, is we think about creativity way too late. We think about it when it comes on my cutting board or when it's in my saute pan. No, 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 no. What we need to do is think about creativity from the seed. The seed determines everything. And our uh, 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 disconnection from the people who are making our seeds is the problem. We are not in conversation. And that's why four companies control our food supply because nobody, nobody, and we're all of us only in the last 30 years or 20 years have we really started to care about farmers and where things are grown and how they're grown. The new, the next conversation is seeds. It has to be, because if we don't change seeds, we will not change the future of our food. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna channel some of the questions that we've been receiving from our audience online. Um, one that speaks directly to what we, we, we were just talking about is, um, what is the relationship between breeding for flavor uh, and climate change? Um, Specifically, um, is there is there some is there some um, contradiction or is there some limitations that are placed by climate crisis in breeding for flavor? Um, should we focus on knowing or researching ways to breed to deal with climate crisis um, more than we focus on breeding for flavor, or are they kind of? projects that we can pursue hand in hand. One of the reasons we're in the, 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 the problem that we're in is agriculture accounts for about 30% of, of global greenhouse gases, 30%. It's more than planes, cars, trains combined agriculture. The way we eat is the problem. And what we're growing is the biggest contributor to climate change. And mostly what we're growing are a few crops, corn, soybeans, 
wheat. That's about that. Those are the three top ones. Sugar. That's it. And we make thousands, tens of thousands of products out of those just four or five ingredients. Rice is another one, of course. But just those five. The answer to climate change and agriculture is diversity. Diversity. We desperately need to encourage and create a marketplace for diversity. But we cannot do diversity by taking old seeds that are 500 years old and expecting farmers to plant them and have the kind of yields that work into a food system that we have now throughout the world. We need to continue to use technology and updated innovation to bring these seeds forward and, and encourage, insist on diversity. Diversity is the key. And what you looked at in this presentation are just five examples, but we need much, much more. And we need to stop the, our reliance on monoculture. And that is the biggest contributor to global climate change. Thank you. I'm also getting questions related to, to food waste and whether or not we should focus more on reducing food waste rather than than breeding for flavor or or how do you see the relationship? I don't see the things? difference. I just don't see the difference. Part of the reason that we waste so much food is because nothing tastes good and it has no value. There's no value. There's no story. There's no, there's no cultural value. There's no connection. And therefore food feels easy to waste. And part of the problem, you know, with the waste discussion is that we talk about you know, the ugly fruits and vegetables that aren't picked in the field that go to waste and that gets a lot of attention. No, it's that, yes, that's terrible. But much more terrible is that we feed cows corn and soybeans. And in this country, we grow 120 million acres of corn and soybeans. That's 120 million wasted acres. That is food waste. That is the conversation we should be talking about. It's taking the massive amounts of acreage of hectares that are devoted to feeding cows, chickens, and pigs, and converting that to diverse grains and vegetables. That will help the planet, it will help our diets, and it will be a lot more delicious for all of us. Thank you. Um, now, this is a question related to how we raise more awareness about these issues. And you've spoken in the past about restaurants as um, places where people come not only to have pleasure and, and happiness, but also to learn. And, and you treat um, your restaurant as, as one such place. Um, my question is regarding the burdens that we're placing on, on the restaurant industry in the sense that it seems to me that we have to right now be places where we create a demand for a specific kind of product, product that, as you say, is, you know, bred from the, not only the right product, but also coming from the right seeds. Uh, it also has to be, they also have to be places that offer uh, a high degree of professional service so that we can, you know, provide people with pleasure and happiness. Um, and we also have to educate people on these issues, but also we have to educate our staff on these issues and increasingly the demands on what the skill sets of a, of, a, of a chef, the chef in this new role that people such as yourself has have defined uh, with, with, a, with a broader scope, it's not enough for us to learn how to do things or to, or to, or to have techniques, but we also need to have, um, let's say, communication skills of a certain kind um, that probably will help us in, in executing this new role of the chef that, that we've been talking about. So it seems like the restaurant is, is, is responsible for a lot of things within our social web. Um, and my question is about the, the concrete particular, um, you know, the feasibility of, of placing such high social demands on, on institutions such as the restaurant. And I, I, I'm, I'm a big evangelist for chefs and for restaurants. I mean, chefs, that's what chefs do. I mean, it's amazing what chefs do. And, and look at your nightly service, the face of adversity that you work around, that you innovate and ideate at the moment uh, and switch gears. Look what chefs have done through the global pandemic. Uh, you know, th this is why we got the job, man. It's like, we are great at maneuvering through a landscape that is treacherous and difficult. I don't think that 
uh, it's too much to expect that that chefs and restaurants will be leaders in a conversation about good food. I don't because we're already there. We're already there. It's about wearing it on our sleeve a little bit more uh, and recognizing the power of this, just this simple fact. When people come to Mugaritz, they are not texting throughout the meal. At least uh, if they are, Andoni's probably throwing them out the door, right? Uh, they're not on their phones uh, and they're not surfing the web. That is the three hours or four hours in your week where you're not doing that. Where tell You tell me a place where people are unplugged from the internet, from the phone, from texting for three hours. Only when you sleep. This alone is the reason why restaurants have an opportunity to communicate a message because people actually have a moment to listen in a very crowded world. That alone is enough to communicate a message. You do not have to be a, a, a proselytizer. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be an educator. You just have to inspire with good food. And my, my sense is the chefs who are leading this are not the ones who are trying to sell it, are not, as you said, the ones who are, are communicating, need, need communication skills. No, you simply need to buy the right product because you curate, remember, and you are the expert and you are buying with your conscience and your tongue and therefore you're a leader and you are cooking deliciousness and opening people's eyes in a moment when they're free to listen and engage. That is all you need. So as Carlo Petrini from the founder of Slow Food said, uh, environmentalists are, uh, you know, environmentalists who is not a, a food lover is a stupid person. And this is true. You, you, the, the connection between being an environmentalist and I would argue an inspiration for what we need now is to cook great food. Do you think that the greatness of that food, do you think the, the tastefulness of that food is immediately obvious to anyone, regardless of their background or education around food? Yes, I do. I do. If your food is good enough and it's honest enough, it's honest enough and the product is right. And yes, the story is there. Yes. People will. Now, are you hitting 100 percent of people where they go home and they change their eating habits? No. Look, man, this this happens over the course of many years. Look, look how long, though, it took for industry to destroy what thousands of years of civilizations built, you know, in the correspondence between farming and, and flavor and health. Thousands of years. It disappeared from 1970s till now. That's only 30 years. Huh? It's only 30 years. It's like, so we're not going to do this tomorrow, but give us 30 years and give us some support. We need government support. Instead of governments going to support the wrong kind of farming, the wrong kind of companies, the wrong kind of seed conglomerates, they should be supporting what Michel Bra, the great French chef said, is what is innate about chefs. Marchand du bonheur, we are merchants of happiness and therefore we change minds. What we need is support. You know, we don't have support. We have competition for doing the right thing. And what we need is governments, we need, uh, 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 support from governments to restaurants to agriculture to farming. And that is the greatest and mo most delicious medicine they could possibly invest in. Do you think chefs or, or cooks should be more active participants in, in, in politics? Or do you think we should, our, our sphere is, is... The time. I wouldn't waste the time. I, you know, uh, politics. Politics are a response to what the culture is insisting on. Make the culture insist on deliciousness as a right for every community and as food sovereignty for every community and as access for every community. Politicians will follow. Politicians will follow. It's a waste of time to try and talk. Look at, in America anyway, look at what the hell they're doing. It's terrible. I mean, it's, you know, it's like before COVID, it was a travesty. Now it's criminal. It's criminal. That's what it is. You're causing death, and you see it in these numbers that are coming out. It is such a the 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 association between bad diets and death is absolute now. There's no mistaking it. So for those people, you know, who are peddling this, which is what they are peddling, they've got blood on their hands. And you need chefs not to lecture. Obviously, what I'm saying, you can't say that out in the world that, uh, that nobody under nobody hears. What you need is chefs to lead with with the Marshal de Bonheur, with the the happiness and the pleasure. And yes, I think you can convert minds with one taste, not even one meal, one taste.
And don't Thank forget, you. don't forget the trickle down, huh? Don't forget that because everybody steals everybody's ideas from up here and they don't do justice to it. They do a terrible job. They dumb it down, but <laughs> it's still taking ideas. So look at, look at the impossible burger. Okay. Look at that. You think that thing would have come had chefs not been, uh, uh, introducing vegetable forward menus and vegetable burgers and options for something other than beef? No way. So they fucked it up, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a future here for chefs like you and leading from the masters like Andoni. Hello, chef. Gracias. Gracias to you, huh? I'll be, I'll be translating if... Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you have to... <laughs> hey, ¿qué tal estás? Hey, Andoni. Este, qué ilusión, de verdad, qué ilusión. Que, que me perdone porque venimos de ir corriendo del aeropuerto. He says he apologizes. He he comes. He's coming from the airport. He's he was in a rush to come greet you. Y quería brindar con él. He wants, Quiero he wants brindar contigo with you. por nuestra amistad. Okay. Por, por, por todo. For your friendship por, por, and for everything. Sí, por, por prestarse, prestarse no, este diálogo. Back, but I have to go to service, so I, I have to be careful what I, what I, what I drink. Dice que, que, que también quiere brindar, pero que tiene que volver al servicio, así que tiene que tener cuidado con cuánto... Uh, nada, que solo con verme brindar a mí es suficiente. No, no, no. <laughs> just, just by looking at him toast, it's enough. It's, it's okay. <laughs> pero quería hacer una pregunta, si me lo permite. Yeah, so he wants to ask you a question, Dan. En, en estos últimos 12 meses, ¿cuál ha sido el momento más, más, más difícil para él? ¿El momento más duro y cómo lo ha afrontado? En estos últimos 12 meses, ¿cuál ha sido el momento más duro y cómo lo ha afrontado? El día que el cocinero se ha ido, fue la cosa más difícil que ha ocurrido para mí. Puse una buena cara en ello, ¿sabes? Aquí tenemos 46 cocineros en nuestra cocina y... Overnight, um, more than 30 left. And, and, and they went out to the world, you know, I lost them. And, and I thought, 20 years of building the team. And, and Well, yeah. Um, he says thank you very much, and I don't know how we're doing with time. Yeah, Jose Mari is coming to say goodbye as well. Uh, goodbye. This is my goodbye. Thank you guys. Yeah. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Dan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye Pleasure. guys. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. <laughs>